Welcome back to another special episode of Organic Chemistry. I'm That Chemist, and today we're going to be ranking the most dangerous chemicals. And so for this episode, the reagents that we're going to be considering have to be common ones, like usual. And we're going to be considering the instability of these reagents, as well as their capacity to start fires. We're not looking at flammability necessarily. We're mostly looking at, like, how big of an issue are these things to deal with? Because, let's be honest, in organic chemistry, everything's flammable. How flammable? Sometimes not that flammable. But if you get anything hot enough, it'll usually burn. Some of these are more dangerous than others. So let's get to it. So let's start with a nice, innocent one like sodium. If you've never worked with sodium, it's a fairly well-behaved metal, as long as you keep it away from water and strong proton sources. But if you put sodium in the wrong environment, it can definitely have issues. Like if you put it with a halogenated solvent, you can get explosions. If you want to see a good video about that, Chemical Force has made a good video about that, and I'll put a link to it here. So it can be used fairly safely, but because it can start fires, I'm going to put it in B tier. Now, for comparison, if we look at potassium, potassium is much more dangerous because not only does it like chemically start fires, but as soon as it's in the presence of something that could take its electrons, it can do what's known as a coulombic explosion, which basically what happens is all of the electrons rush out of the chunk of potassium metal, concentrating a positive charge at the center, and that charge builds up and builds up and builds up until the repulsive forces are so great that it explodes, which is the main reason why that you see a giant explosion when potassium's in water. And there was a really good paper a few years ago that actually like talked about this. Maybe it was about 10 years ago. So potassium is very dangerous. I'm going to put it in A tier. Um, I might change it to S tier, but there's some other ones here that definitely belong in S tier. So we're going to leave a bit of space in there. So let's look at another one like diacetyl peroxide. Diacetyl peroxide has an alarmingly low amount of carbon to oxygen. Uh, which basically means if you were to just heat this up, it would mostly convert to CO2 and water. Not entirely. You can see that there's two CO2 molecules there with probably an ethane molecule left between them afterwards. But that's a fairly low ratio. So this is kind of a sketchy reagent to work with. It's also a peroxide. So they're known to like cleave that OO bond and make two radicals. This can definitely start uh, explosions. It's going to go in S tier. Now, I personally don't know of any instances of having mishaps with this. However, I also don't know anyone crazy enough to work with it. So it belongs in S tier just for how obscure it is. Okay, let's pick a nice one. So I got a good story about this one. So this is K-selectride or potassium selectride. It's a very strong reducing agent. And so we once were using this to make dithioformate from carbon disulfide. And after the reaction, we were filtering it, washing it with THF. And the product that we got, the diethylformate, started spontaneously burning outwards from the filter paper. And it was starting to catch on fire. And so uh, I did the natural thing you might think to do. Put it out with anhydrous ethanol. Uh, and for whatever reason, that worked. It stopped the smoldering. And the only assumption I could figure is this borane byproduct, which if you get rid of the potassium and the hydride, we'd have this uh, tris sec butyl borane, which is highly, highly flammable. And so this is likely what was causing the combustion, some residual borane that was forming some sort of Lewis acid base complex to the solution. So I'm going to put this in C tier because it's, it's okay to handle, but you just have to be careful with it. Okay, so let's look at fuming nitric acid. Fuming nitric acid, it, when it's concentrated, is just 100% nitric acid, more or less, give or take a percent. And fuming nitric acid just destroys nitrile gloves. And if you're working in a lab, you should usually be wearing nitrile gloves. And most labs that I've been in don't have any other solutions other than latex gloves. Now, latex is also not well suited for uh, fuming nitric. I think you need a certain type of other plastic glove that's specially made for working with uh, nitric acid. Um, you can get them. It might be vinyl rubber gloves. But overall, nitric acid creates TNT, it creates nitroglycerin, uh, and it's just an overall sketchy reagent. So fuming nitric belongs in S tier as well. Okay, now let's talk about acetylene. So I have a very traumatic experience with acetylene. Not too many labs work with it because it's a fairly dangerous uh, chemical. It, it's also quite flammable, but if it's mixed with oxygen, it could be explosive. And so one of my professors decided that it would be a great idea in our physical chemistry class to demonstrate uh, in, an, in a sealed classroom, which we ended up opening the door and windows beforehand, the detonation of acetylene with oxygen. 
And he had tricked us first by lighting a balloon full of nitrogen on fire. And it was just pop. It's a balloon. And we're all like, aha, of course you wouldn't do it. You're not that crazy. You wouldn't, you wouldn't ignite a balloon full of acetylene in a classroom with 20 of us there. You wouldn't do that. And so then uh, he ignited the next balloon and kabang. We didn't even hear the bang. It was just flash of light and ears ringing like a flash bang. If you've ever played Call of Duty um, and slowly like it was burned onto the back of my retina, the, the explosion. And then slowly, like it started fading, but I couldn't hear properly. Everything sounded like a tin can. And so I have video footage of this from multiple angles that I might upload to the channel in the future. Uh, but, uh, it was terrible. And I still have tinnitus every single night when I go to sleep because of that explosion. And that happened about seven years ago. So because of this acetylene, I'm going to put it in S tier because holy shit. Okay, tosyl azide. Tosyl azide has all of the benefits of being an azide. It's quite toxic. We're not focusing on toxicity in this episode, but it's also got a very small ratio of carbon to nitrogen. And so when you start having things like azides, nitro compounds, you want to have as much carbon in, in there as possible. Otherwise, things can start decomposing really quickly. So this is basically fuel and an initiation source, right? Or an ignition source. And so I had made 10 grams of this at one point, not knowing how toxic it was. I actually probably made 20 grams, but I used about 10 grams of it. Uh, I actually have a video on this channel, which I can link here, where I actually quench the remaining 10 grams of it that I had. So when you make this, you just make it from tosyl chloride with sodium azide. But it's uh, quite an unstable reagent. It's used for making diazo groups. You can make uh, azide derivatives using click chemistry. But the issue with this is it's shock sensitive. So if you drop it, or if you hit it hard enough, it will just explode. And a friend of mine had a good rule of thumb, which is for every gram of it, if you drop it, you're going to lose a finger. And so I had 10 grams of it. And he he didn't know that at that point. I'm like, oh, I'd like, you know, I got 10 grams of this, right? He's like, are you insane? You need to deal with that. You shouldn't ever have that much at all. And so uh, one night before I left the lab, I was just too concerned about having that much of a liability around other researchers. And so before I went home, I slowly quenched it using ethyl acetoacetate. It forms the alpha diazo compound, and then through basic workup, it uh, decarboxylates and then ultimately uh, quenches. So tosyl azide, I'm going to put in A tier, maybe B tier. Pretty sketchy reagent. Organic azides in general give off bad vibes. Sodium hydride. Sodium hydride can start fires if you're not careful. I don't know of anyone running into issues with sodium hydride. I've worked with it quite a bit. It can generate hydrogen, and hydrogen is flammable. But it's like, you know, it's sketchier than sodium. So maybe I'll move sodium to C tier. The The difference is sodium hydride is usually a mixture with mineral oil. So that kind of tames it a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, sodium is still kind of sketchy, but we don't, I don't think there's very many things I'm thinking towards F tier. Maybe if we just like move most of these down, uh, that would be okay. But I don't feel comfortable moving potassium or tosyl azide down to B tier. So hydrogen peroxide. It depends on how concentrated it is. If you have the typical at home, which is like one to 3% hydrogen peroxide, I mean, it's fine. It's, you know, if you're starting to create derivatives of it, sure, that could be a little bit hazardous, but it's once you start getting into like 10%, 20% that you start playing with fire a little bit because these can be unstable. They can also react with a lot of stuff to make potentially more explosive uh, peroxides. So let's just say we're talking about 20% hydrogen peroxide or higher. I'm going to put it at B. It, it might belong higher. Once you get to like 100% hydrogen peroxide, absolutely S++ tier. Uh, super dangerous. But if, at, if we're talking about like 10, 20%, we'll put it in B tier. Now potassium hydride. Uh, in contrast to sodium hydride, I do have a potassium hydride story. But fortunately, it does not involve me. So I was working at this one lab when I was an undergrad researcher. And uh, their neighboring lab at one point had burned down because a student had to quench some potassium hydride. They had it in mineral oil. They had it in like an excess of mineral oil and hexane because they'd been washing it. And they figure, oh, I can just add water on top of it. Water sits on top of hexane and all the potassium hydride will slowly float up and react with the water. So they added the water to the potassium hydride, which was like, uh, I think it was like 50 grams of potassium hydride, some ridiculous amount. And guess what? Water does not float on top of hexane. Water sinks to the bottom. So water sank to the bottom where all the nice dense potassium hydride was, uh, and it started a fire. And then the hexane's in there, and the mineral oil caught on fire. And so they had a massive ball of fire. 
And uh, so what you might not know is there's special types of fire extinguishers. Certain ones are made for different purposes. There's ABC, which A is for ash. If it's got wood-based products, it's for ash. B is for barrel, for flammable stuff that comes from a barrel. Um, and C, I believe, is for like kitchen-related stuff. Um, it might be ABCK and K is for kitchen, but uh, C uh, is for another type of flammability. Now, the difference is there's a special class for flammable solids like potassium uh, hydride. And so the issue with potassium hydride is if you put water on this, this will create hydrogen and it will be exothermic. So this is going to start a fire. Um, the only way to get rid of this is to like completely suffocate it. So there's special fire extinguishers that are yellow that usually are just like made of salt or sodium bicarbonate or something related, uh, which will just totally swamp the stuff and prevent it from reacting with air. Okay. So this lab didn't have one of those. They had a normal red fire extinguisher, which is an ABC or an AB fire extinguisher. Uh, they use up the whole thing. The fire calms down for a little bit, but there's still water and potassium hydride. So the fire starts again. And they went and found another fire extinguisher, used up that whole one as well. And, uh, okay, so there's two empty fire extinguishers, and they go and find a third, and they use up the whole third fire extinguisher. And you might be thinking at this point, uh, that must be the maximum number of fire extinguishers someone could ever use and think that the next one's going to work. But unfortunately, that is not the case. They went and found a fourth fire extinguisher, and they used that whole thing as well. And after the fourth fire extinguisher was empty, they couldn't find any more, they ran out of the lab, and their lab burned down. Potassium hydride gets A tier. Um... So, you know, maybe don't let undergrads work with potassium hydride, and maybe study your density, kids. Okay, lithium aluminum hydride. Lithium aluminum hydride, it's a fairly tame reagent. It can start fires, it just depends on whether you have the solid or have it in solution. If you have it in solution, it's both the fuel and the ignition source, so that's a little bit more sketchy. Uh, as long as you're being responsible with lithium aluminum hydride, you can work it up okay. But in the wrong hands, it definitely could start fires. I'm going to say it's probably slightly worse than sodium hydride, so I'm going to put it in B tier. We've had uh, quenching lithium aluminum hydride before, and like it, it like burned down a garbage can that we quenched it in. So like it's it's no joke, but you know it's it's not potassium hydride levels of spooky. Perchloric acid. There's always warnings about perchloric acid. I don't know too many people who work with perchloric acid personally. Uh, usually certain labs have to have special designations to even work with it because it's such a potent oxidizer. Um, and it's just because that chlorine doesn't want to have those oxygens at all. And so it'll give them to almost anything. It can be exothermic. You have an oxidizing agent fire. So perchloric acid probably belongs in S tier as well, but there's a couple other here that are going to go in S tier. So I'm going to put it in A tier to save space. Manganese heptoxide. So manganese heptoxide is very easy to prepare. It's prepared using potassium permanganate and concentrated sulfuric acid. It's a nice green oil. I have videos of that on my channel as well, and I'll put a card to that here. And it can react with almost anything. So I had seen videos on YouTube of this reacting with acetone, this reacting with cotton, and it's instantly, foomp, massive flame. But I wanted to know, how reactive is this? And so if you make potassium permanganate react with sulfuric acid, you get some potassium hepto or manganese heptoxide. This will, this will ignite cyclohexane. It will ignite hexane. And uh, my undergrad was like, what's the mechanism of that? I'm like, it's got a lot of oxygen and it's got to get rid of it fast. So manganese heptoxide, very, very good oxidizer. Maybe the best oxidizer. If you heat it up, it generates ozone. What other chemical generates ozone? Exactly. Manganese heptoxide, S tier. Scarier thing is that normal people can get those chemicals. So that's terrifying. DMDO. DMDO, dimethyl dioxirane. It's basically a monomer of acetone peroxide. Acetone peroxide is the common backpack suicide bomber chemical. So this is a sketchy reagent. You have to prepare it in solution as a solution in acetone, usually using oxone or related per sulfates. I'm going to put it in S tier as well. As long as you're doing it on small scales, it's okay, but it's still a very, very sketchy reagent, okay? Tertbuli. There's people who've died from setting themselves on fire with it, even with, like, fire-resistant lab coats and stuff. It's It makes a giant blue flame. It's very scary to work with. S tier for sure. Palladium on carbon. So palladium on carbon is an interesting chemical. 
because it's palladium finely divided over a carbon surface, it's the catalyst required for combustion as well as the fuel, because the carbon is the fuel. So if this gets finely divided in air, again, thump, massive fireball. Uh, I've had this a couple times, and you'd be surprised, just a couple grains loose and the whole thing could suddenly go. And if you're near solvents, that's really dangerous. So I'm going to put palladium on carbon in B tier, because it's definitely less stable than sodium hydride. Now, n Bewley, it's dangerous. It can start fires. But, yeah, maybe we should move case electride down to E tier and sodium down to E tier. I'm going to make room in D tier for n butylithium. n butylithium is definitely a little bit sketchy. Uh, but, you know, it wouldn't be on this list if it wasn't somewhat sketchy in the first place. It's fairly well behaved as long as you treat it right. It generates butane, which is flammable. So it's, again, both an ignition source and a flammable. So that's kind of sketchy. I'm going to put it in D tier. Sec butylithium slightly worse, but it's still okay-ish. So I'm going to put it in B tier because it's like halfway between T buley and N buley. We've got S buley. And we've got two left. Okay. So silver nitride is formed from the Tolan's test because you make a silver oxide solution with ammonia and you get Tolan's reagent, a test for aldehydes. Now silver nitride is explosive. If it's detonated, it will convert to silver metal and nitrogen gas. So this is a potential ignition source as well. This is a sketchy reagent. If you had this in its pure form, it would probably be higher, but because it's in the Tolan's test and we'll even do Tolan's tests with undergrads, I'm gonna put it in D tier. Now, finally, we have benzoyl peroxide. Benzoyl peroxide is, again, a potential explosive. It's used as a radical generator. If this cleaves to its uh, two radicals, this can decarboxylate, give off CO2, and create a benzene-centered radical. Now, there's definitely been instances in manufacturing where this has caused hundreds or thousands of deaths, as well as completely destroying buildings. So I believe benzoyl peroxide belongs in A tier. Now, let me know what you think down below. I'm sure some of these placements will be controversial, so I'd be happy to hear what you have to say down below. If you think there's any really other important ones that uh, I didn't include, I'd be happy to hear it in the comments. And I hope you enjoyed this video. Have a great day.